Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and welcome to Read Smart, the official podcast of the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. My name is Toby Mundy and I'm the director of the prize and I'm delighted in this series of podcasts to be in conversation with the shortlisted authors for the 2022 award. Today I'm talking to Jonathan Friedland, the author of The Escape Artist, The Man Who Broke Out of Auschwitz to Warn the World. As always, the podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation and we're very grateful for their support. Jonathan, welcome to the Bailey Gifford Prize podcast and congratulations. Thank you very much, Toby. So the obvious question is, who is the escape artist? The escape artist refers to Rudolf Verber, um, uh, who was uh, an inmate of Auschwitz, arrived on the last day of June 1942 and was there an unusually long time. I mean, that's one of the big uh, significances of his story anyway, even if he hadn't escaped. But he, you know, the life expectancy of a Jew in Auschwitz was measured in hours for most of them. A small minority were then selected as prisoners to essentially be worked to death. The Nazis called the policy annihilation through labor. And most of those people would last a matter of months. Rudolf Verber was there for the best part of two years, uh, which makes him extremely unusual, a kind of ultra witness. He witnessed so much. He had this really rare panoramic view of Auschwitz. He saw almost every stage of the murder process from the arrival of new Jew, uh, of Jews on, tra- on transports, on those cattle trucks that would come in, almost up to the very threshold of the gas chambers itself. He saw so much. But his significance in terms of this story is that as a teenager, um, just 19 years old in April of 1944, he broke out of Auschwitz, uh, one of a vanishingly small number of people to do it. I mean, Jews were held under the tightest possible security. It was next to impossible to escape. Um, The day before he did it, uh, nobody had ever done it before. No Jew had ever done it before. The day before he escaped, in fact, one Jewish prisoner was taken out of Auschwitz by an SS man. I tell that story in the book. But to physically break out, to engineer your own escape, um, not being, you know, walked out of the camp by an SS man, Rudolf Ferber and his escape companion, Fred Wetzler, were in fact the very first. And they did it, as the subtitle suggests, in order to warn the world. And they're one of only, of the two of them, two, they're two of the only the four who ever escaped from this death camp, is that right? Well, whoever broke out in that way I described, I mean, five if you include the one who was taken out of the um, camp by uh, a Nazi guard. There were others who broke out only to then be captured, recaptured, and brought back and, uh, and, and often killed. Uh, there are a couple of cases whose outcome is unknown, although I think most people would expect that uh, and, con- and have concluded that because the outcome is unknown, they almost certainly met their deaths because otherwise they would have told the world afterwards, they would have said, I'm the person who escaped from Auschwitz. So the way I put it is that Rudolf Herbert was the first uh, along with Fred Wetzel, they were the first Jews that we know about to break out, to engineer their own escape from Auschwitz. Uh, but the huge significance of it was what they then did afterwards and what their purpose was in escaping. And I'd, I'd love to get to that, that 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 aspect of their lives and his life um, shortly. Uh, prior to that, this wasn't the first time he'd escaped from the clutches of the Nazis. Is, is that right? No, no, that's right. I mean, the, the reason why I called it the escape artist is that Rudolf Verber, born Walter Rosenberg, was a serial escape artist. I mean, a serial escapologist that as a teenager um, in Slovakia, rural Slovakia, which is where he was living, uh, the he responded to those first rounds, those first uh, roundups of de- uh, uh, of Jews being deported to the east with the response of, well, of course I'm not going to do that. Of course I'm not going to submit to being deported from the only country I've ever known where I, the language is my mother tongue and where I'm a citizen. And he tried to escape. Uh, and he had a couple of, in some ways, successful escapes, but um, which, you know, I tell the story of those. Uh, in in the book, how he um, first of all tried to make for London, actually, as a 17-year-old. He thought he had a vision 
a fantasy, really, that he was going to somehow cross occupied Europe on foot and make his way to freedom in London. He then was caught and was taken to one of these transit camps in Novaki in Slovakia. And again, he looked around and thought, why are these people staying here? Obviously, you should try and escape. And he did get out only to then be recaptured. Um, and so when he found himself in Auschwitz, he was already somebody whose card had been marked. There were, even though he was 17, there were extra guards laid on for him because they thought this is one we know, you know, we have a, he has a track record of trying to escape. Uh, and so he got to Auschwitz, age 17. And again, from the minute he walked in, he was thinking, how am I going to get out of here? Um, that that was on his mind. And as I describe in the later chapters of the book, escape would be a theme of his post-war life as well. He was somebody who would not, um, you know, buckle and would not just take imprisonment lightly. He would escape and escape and escape all through his life. Be because he was there for such a long time, he did all these different jobs, as you said. And I'm interested in this place called Canada. But I'm also curious about what it was that enabled him to survive so long in in such a in a murder factory, essentially. Yes. Uh, on the on that question of how he survived so long, I defer in a way to the answer Rudy himself would give, and a lot of Holocaust survivors give. And I've interviewed quite a few of them over the years, and what almost always they say, luck. They say it was random good fortune that enabled them to survive. And it's important to them this because they do not want to claim any kind of personal quality because that would then imply those who did not survive were somehow lacking. And they weren't. They were physically brave, physically strong, ingenious, talented people who never survived. And it was no fault of theirs that they didn't survive. It was often arbitrary capricious, random acts of uh, uh, of good fortune that kept people like Verber alive. And I describe several of them in the book, moments where he has the narrowest possible escapes, just the Amazing. whim. I yeah. mean, that, that's right. The whim of a guard or, a, or, or an SS man who has a moment of, uh, of an impulse to shoot somebody and just shoots the person inches to the left or right of of, of of Rudy, and so you, he was very clear that there was no credit that to, that he sought. All of that said, it did not hurt that he was physically strong, that he had many many languages. By the time he arrives as a seventeen year old, he's speaking obviously Slovak and Czech and Yiddish, but also German, also Russian, also some Hungarian. That meant he was adept at moving around the camp. It meant he was an asset to the Auschwitz underground, the Auschwitz resistance. Again, this was you know, new to me, and I think it will be to a lot of people reading this book, that there was an underground inside Auschwitz, a resistance. Um, he, had, he had those, and he was physically sort of uh, uh, robust, but also he had great ingenuity. He was clever, and that really helped. Um, but uh, you know, all of those would have been for nothing had he not been um, also blessed by good fortune. In terms of, which is an odd thing to talk about in a, in a place of such horror, but there we are. In terms of the uh, Canada you mentioned and, yes. and how he was stationed in all these places um, as a prisoner, as a slave. Uh, it's crucial to mention that there was no freedom there, but you were assigned work. And sometimes right at the beginning, it was just physical backbreaking work, building factories that the Nazis were in effect lending out for free to the big German conglomerates of the time who saw a way to turn a huge profit building up these big uh, industrial plant factories where they would never have to pay a penny or only a few pennies in labour costs. But one of his first long jobs, long-term jobs, was in a place the prisoners themselves nicknamed Canada with a K. Um, Canada partly because the real Canada, the actual Canada with a C, was seen by a lot of Central Europeans at the time as a kind of El Dorado of, um, a, a, as a magical place where you could make your fortune. And this part of the camp of Auschwitz was the El Dorado of Auschwitz. It was a place where there was vast wealth. There was cash, there was jewels, there was, um, you know, fine cognac and silks and so on. There in the middle of Auschwitz, how come because there were also huge piles of suitcases and pots and pans and blankets. And to his shame, Rudy himself did not clock straight away what this was. It took him some time. He was embarrassed at uh, how much time it took him for the penny to drop. 
But what this place was, was the warehouse, the storehouse of all the worldly goods that had been brought to Auschwitz by Jews who had been sent there uh, from all points of Europe. I mean, from Holland, Belgium, France, uh, Greece, all over. The Jews of Europe were converging on this place and they were bringing their worldly goods with them. And sometimes they were bringing things of value, which they thought they may need to sell or use for bribery or to survive. And they were all piled up. And the penny dropped slowly as he began to realise, hold on, there are piles of clothes here. There are men's clothes, there are women's clothes, but there are also children's clothes and there are prams and there are children's shoes. And yet I'm looking around this place and there are no children and there are no babies. So why, where are all these, why are all these prams here and all these children's clothes and shoes? And slowly he begins to realise there are people being brought to this place who I'm not seeing because they are not, they, they never spend a day here alive. And what began as his words, vague suspicions, began to harden into the conclusion that he was in a place without precedent in human history, which was exactly as you'd say, it was a factory of death. It was a killing factory designed to just produce hu you know, human corpses at a rate of a, a, a kind of assembly line, industrial rates. Well, it's a testimony to the quality of the book and, it, and the narrative that this revelation hits the reader with a, a sledgehammer force, even though, of course, one knows very well what the purpose of Auschwitz is. It's a brilliant sequence. So let's go back a little bit. So he's at this point about 19 years old, but you first encountered Verber when you were 19 years old. Is that right? You were watching the Landsman film Shoah. That's quite right. I was in a cinema in um, in in, in uh, the Curzon Mayfair in central London, age 19 myself, um, in watching the first of two parts of this nine and a half hour epic documentary, I was a strange kind of nineteen year old. I now realise um, two parts, you know, one four and a half hour, one four and a half hours, one a bit even longer. And sitting there in the cinema watching this procession of it's an unusual film, as you know. It's it's it, there's no archive in it. It's a documentary that only consists of interviews with witnesses, and it was to me a procession of these very old and apparently broken men, mainly men, some women, but mainly men, who had seemed to me hunched and grey and defeated, and then suddenly exploding onto the screen is somebody completely unlike all those others. He's tanned, he's got a head of thick, lustrous, dark hair, he speaks English, where the others are in, you know, Czech or Russian or Polish. Uh, he's in New York City, um, he's, he's wearing a tan leather coat, he could be you know, Al Pacino in Scarface or something. He looks like a 70s movie star. And he's talking about his experience of Auschwitz, even though he looks a generation younger than everyone else you've seen. Uh, and in a way he was, I now realise, of course, because he had he was there as a teenager. And Landsman mentions almost as an aside that this man had escaped from Auschwitz. And I say it as an aside because actually that's what, not what Landsman's interested in. He's there to talk to Verba as someone who had this unique 360 degree view of what happened in Auschwitz and he wants to gain that expertise. But there sitting there as a 19 year old, I was enraptured by the kind of sheer charisma of this man on screen and intrigued to know more about how on earth he had escaped because I knew even as a 19 year old, I knew that essentially Jews did not escape from Auschwitz. I mean, there were escapes for, of Polish prisoners, of Soviet prisoners of war, measured in the dozens or scores, but, you know, Jews, no. I mean, they, they couldn't get out. And uh, the story stayed with me, actually, for many, many years. It was there in the back of my mind as this amazing story. And sometimes I would mention his name and be very struck that other people did not know his name. Mm -hmm. um, that he, you know, even people really quite schooled in and educated in the Holocaust, um, but who uh, 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 had not, were not familiar with him. But I never forgot it. And I found myself in recent years sort of coming back to it because, you know, in the, in post 2016, particularly we were living in this era, the post-truth era, um, uh, the era of, you know, fake news. And I began thinking a bit about truth. And the point about Verba was that he did this extraordinary escape in order to get the truth out uh, 
from underneath this mountain of lies, I mean, that's something we'll perhaps come on to, the extent to which lying was absolutely central to what he was witnessing there at Auschwitz. And th this fascination with Weber, which stayed with you, um, was then crystallised when you had realised that his wife was alive, or one of his wives was still alive in Muswell Hill. That's, Is that right? That's exactly right. And I mean, she had a suitcase as well. Oh, she did. I mean, that's what the... Um, that was the sort of a big moment, actually, in this process. I was still at the stage of thinking about whether or not this was a book that was worth a story worth pursuing as a book. I, I wanted to be sure that it hadn't been told before, for example. And I was amazed to see that apart from Rudolf Verber's own memoir, which is a really wonderful uh, source, but 60 years old now, there was no other book. He's mentioned in a couple of other places, but nobody had sat down to write the whole story. But I began to look into it and thought, OK, well, who would be able to tell me about him? And... Actually, both of the women who were married to him are, you know, at that stage were still alive because his widow, his second wife, Robin Verber, is still alive and lives in the United States and was a wonderful uh, source and interviewee and, and guide for this book. And we spoke, you know, for many, many hours. But I also did know that he had been married to uh, a, a previous time and that his wife was called Goethe Verbova and she had lived at some point, I knew, in London. Uh, I knew she'd been an academic at University College London. That's all I really knew. I knew also that she would be 93 years old by then. And I thought the chances were pretty slim that I would be able to track her down. But I did that classic journalist thing, which sometimes we do, where you essentially make up an email address, you know, first name, dot, last name, at UCL. And I thought, you know, I'll try it and see what happens. And, you know, that it's very likely that this is going to bounce back to me, uh, you know, mail undeliverable kind of thing. But it didn't. And instead, half an hour later, instead of a message coming from a, uh, a colleague or even what I was slightly worried about, truthfully, was a bereaved son or daughter saying, I'm afraid, you know. Instead, I got this email back saying, Dear Jonathan, I am very glad to hear from you. I am living in Muswell Hill, about 20 minutes away from where you are. Why don't you come and see me? And this was in the COVID summer <laughs> of, of 2020. And we sat in her garden. We both sat. It was very warm. We sat in, in deck chairs in her garden, socially distanced. Uh, and I put, had my you know recording device on the ground, which I nudged towards her with my foot because I didn't get to dare go too near. And, and you know, heaven forbid, get, you know, get, get, let her catch anything from me. And we talked for many, many hours. And the reason why she was so significant was that she wasn't just his first wife, married to Rudy in post-war, then communist Czechoslovakia. She had also been his childhood sweetheart and had known the young Walter Rosenberg, as was, as if when he was 14 and she was 12. So she was able to tell me something so important, which was the boy before the man before Auschwitz. She was able to give me the, a sense of the person he, already, he had been before he went through the horrors of Auschwitz. And that was a, a tremendously valuable insight. But the, the sort of crowning moment of it came, I think, in our second last visit when she said, um, I have something for you. And her grandson was there. She said, it's upstairs and I'm, I'm too weak to be able to get it myself. And he went upstairs and he came back down holding this red suitcase. And she held onto it as he did. And the two of them handed it over to me. And she said, I want you to have these. These are Rudy's letters. And it was a suitcase packed with his handwritten letters, photographs as well. And that was the moment where I thought, you know, I'm somehow sort of meant to write this book, um, that this this moment of oh, trust. Amazing. And those letters were extraordinary. He wrote handwritten letters to his daughters, one of them, you know, 42 pages long. I mean, there was so much of his himself there pouring out the personality, which you don't get actually in a memoir that had been you know ghost written with a brilliant fleet street journalist or um in, in in lectures or interview transcripts all of which were wonderful sources by the way and he you know he was often a witness in 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 trials um uh, of war criminals after the war and th and he was on the stand and those court transcripts were useful but actually having the handwritten letters added a whole other layer to my understanding of him um before we get into the sort of his after after what happened to him after the escape, how did he become what 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 happened to Walter Rosenberg? Where did Rosenberg go? Well, our, how, come, yeah, how did Verba supersede Rosenberg? Yes, I mean, the, well, the two of them, we we you know, we'll, we'll perhaps get to this on the on the escape. But after they had escaped, they were wanted men. Um, 
even though Verber was still a teenager, he was wanted and reproduced in the book is the cable from the SS distributed to Gestapo stations, police stations all round Nazi occupied occupied Europe, you know, to the furthest reaches of the empire, every Gestapo station would have had this on the pin board there with his name on it, wanted, uh, you know, Alfred Wetzler and Walter Rosenberg wanted for as, as fugitives for having escaped from Auschwitz. And uh, he was therefore a man on the run and in hiding. And so he was issued after his escape with false Aryan papers and given a new identity. And that, that the name of this new identity, identity was Rudolf Verber, an impeccably Czech name. In fact, there was a Czech nationalist, an anti-Semite two or three generations earlier by that very name. And what was interesting is uh, when the war was over, Fred Wetzler immediately dropped his code, you know, new false name and went back to being uh, Alfred Wetzler. But Rudy liked and embraced his new identity. I think he liked the fresh start it represented. And I think on some level, it was all part of this escapology. He was escaping even himself in some way, even his own first name. So the, I'm not giving away any secrets to say that the book opens in intensely dramatic fashion with Fred and uh, Walter hiding and trying in, within, for three days to escape from Auschwitz. It's an astonishing, gripping opening sequence to the, to the book. And then suddenly in Easter 44, they're out. They're out. <laughs> what do they do next? And how, do they, how does the, 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 the Verba uh, Wetzler report come into being? And Yes, well, no, good. Thank you for, for not exactly giving the details of, the, of how they escape, because I, I, I'm very keen that people read the book. And I always try to hold that back if I can, partly because I'm like, you know, people my age, boys, perhaps my age, you know, read a lot of Second World War escape stories. This, I think, is the most thrilling. I mean, I'm biased, obviously, but I just think it's, it's the odds were so daunting against them. Oh, it's amazingly improbable. <laughs> it's, it is. It's incredible. You feel really. it. Yeah. And, and so I just on the level of an adventure story, I think it's amazing. So I, I'm, I want people to read that. But yes, once they were out of the camp, the, the, the danger was not over for them. On the contrary, they were now in Nazi occupied Europe and a Nazi occupied Poland. And with and as they as Verba said himself, you know, we had no map, no compass, no friends. There was no network of resist fellow resistance comrades ready to greet them, as there were actually in the case where Poles or others got out, they could rely on the presence, if not immediately outside, then around of allies. That was not the case if you were a Jew in Poland in 1944. You were on your own. And so the two of them had to, you know, cross in the dead of night. They didn't dare be seen in the daytime. They had to cross marshlands and mountains and forests in order to get out and dodge, you know, as they did in the end, dodge German bullets, dodge potential collaborators. Uh, they were all around and not be seen. And they took some tremendous risks and had you know, uh, 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 some moments again of random good luck that saved them. But somehow they did cross the border after 11 days into their home country and made it back into Slovakia. And there, importantly, they were able to make contact with the tiny remnant Jewish community, those who had not been, like Walter or Rudy, deported, those who had been allowed to stay behind, and there in the basement of a, in hiding in the provincial Sir, uh, Slovak town of Žilina outpoured this evidence from them of all they had witnessed. And in Verba's case, incredibly, um, in, or in Verba's case especially, um, what they had memorized. I mean, I toyed with calling the book The Memory Man because, you know, if we're talking about improbable, I mean, what he had committed to memory, he had essentially observed every one of the trains coming in, the transports, their point of origin, the number of carriages, the estimated number of Jews on there, and then an estimated proportion of those who had been selected for annihilation through labor and those who had been marched off immediately to be gassed and was able, therefore, to present this testimony to uh, these, you know, Jewish officials who were actually, uh, the, you know, community officials, but working secretly in a kind of resistance underground themselves, 
and able to give them the what was the very first full accounting of the uh, killing going on in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And his memory was so extraordinary, wasn't it? Was it? Did I, am I right to remember that in later life, if if he saw, if he met someone with an Auschwitz tattoo, he was sufficiently acquainted with the machinery of mass murder that he could infer from the tattoo when they arrived at the camp. And yes, that's right. All sorts of information about their point of origin and so forth. Extraordinary, horrible things to have in your head. Yes, I mean, one, one to me, it's one of the amazing stories within this story is he was in later life in a restaurant in Manhattan in the 1970s. It was a hot day. Their waiter was uh, had his sleeves rolled up and Rudy recognised the tattoo and turned to him and said, Benjim, 1943, you know, a town in Poland, and said May 1943 and the date, he remembered the date and the man looked at him, you know, paled and said, how did you know? You know, and he had worked out from the uh, tattooed number, the because the tattoos and tattooed numbers corresponded to the train that brought Jews in and he memorized every train. I, I mean, I should say that something... It's astounding. It's just astounding. It, it is mind-boggling, the... the the, the fact that simultaneously he had this extraordinary gift of memory and the physical sort of strength to mount an escape that both came together in one person. You know, I've spoken to some people who've read the book who say, look, I'm not a religious person, but you've got to believe somehow the hand of, the, you know, something divine was there to choose that of all the people who was to make a successful escape. It would be somebody who had memorized all the data you needed to prove what had actually, what was going on in Auschwitz. I should just say something about the motive, though, because this is important. After he'd worked in Canada with all those possessions, Rudy worked for 10 months on the railway platform into which all these transports would arrive. And he came to this really crucial realisation, which was that all the Jews getting off these trains had no idea where they were brought. They all thought they were coming to be resettled to new lives and new villages in the East. That's why they'd brought the pots and pans and blankets and children's toys and shoes, because they thought they were relocating. They had no idea. And what he saw was that, therefore, they were getting off the trains in relatively orderly fashion. They were lining up for selection because they thought that they were going to begin these new lives. And they thought that because that's what they'd been told. And it's at that moment, that, going back to what we said right at the start about lies, it's at that moment that Rudy realises deception isn't just a sort of added extra. It is central to the Nazis' killing method because it relies, their method, on order and calm. And it's only through deception they get order and calm. And that's why he decides to break out because he thinks the only way we are ever going to throw sand in the gears of the Nazi killing machine is by breaking that ignorance of the victims and letting them know what fate awaits them. And that's why he wanted to get out and write that report. It's an amazing scene. And, and as you say, that, that moment when he realises that the cardinal principle of the mass murder is, is, to keep these, is to keep the victims in the dark. That line, it's much easier to slaughter lambs than to hunt deer. It's ch chilling. It's a chilling line, my goodness. It is. And it's one of the things, actually, that um, Verber said to Claude Landsman in the in the full interview, whether or not it made it in the film, I'd have to remind myself, but it's an, it is a chilling line. It's the line of someone who had spent his boyhood in, or later boyhood in the Slovak countryside and had seen that in an abattoir, you can kill hundreds and hundreds of sheep in very quick order. But if as a hunter, you have to hunt deer, you can only pick off one at a time. And what he realized there was the Jews, by, believe, by, by, by not knowing their fate, were in effect lining up as if they were sheep, whereas if they knew and could he could he could get word to them, they would then. He had no illusions, by the way, about them mounting some kind of armed revolt. He thought what they might do is panic. They might stampede. There might be chaos. They would start running in a hundred directions. Then they would become scattered deer. Very hard for the or harder for the SS to pick them off one at a time. One or two might get away. That's better than none. And the alternative was none, because if they were lining up in those orderly columns, they were making their own slaughter relatively easy. And uh, was it Yehuda Bauer, the Holocaust scholar, who, who said that it wasn't so much that many Jews, particularly the Hungarian Jews, lacked information about what was going on? It's just that the, the idea of genocide was too huge to absorb. Is that, is that, is that That's right? That's right. I mean, they're, they're, and Bauer and Verba would, would be sort of antagonists after the war, because... Mm. 
Rudolf Verber was very animated by the idea that his report, if only it had got into the hands of the people who needed it most, namely the Jews of Europe and specifically the Jews of Hungary, the last remaining Jewish community not yet in 19, April 1944, not yet pulled in to the Nazi inferno. He thought if you could get word to them, then maybe you could save some lives. And the he was so angry, you'd, um, Rudolf Verber, because the report did not get into their hands, partly because of the decisions of one particular Hungarian Jewish official who did not, for reasons which the book gets into and which are historically still contested, but yeah. uh, he did not pass on that warning. And that burnt Rudolf Verber up. And, and Bauer's view was, you know, even if they'd got the warning and actually said Bauer, they did have enough fragments of information to put two and two together, even if they had, they had got the warning, it is a different thing to know in, in information and to believe it. And those, there are two different sort of cognitive stages. And I, I think that what, this story, I hope the escape artist, uh, throws open a really interesting philosophical question in a way about what counts as knowledge. What do we actually, what do we think we know? And is belief a really central part of knowledge? It's not just enough for you to know that two plus two equals four. You have to, on some level, believe that two plus two is four. And they are ever so slightly different things. Um, and so he, Rudy, was obsessed about the information. Others have said the problem was this was unbelievable that there was such a place in the heart of Europe, that Germany, the most civilized nation in Europe, would have constructed a thing that was unknown in human history up to that point, namely a site for the deliberate mass killing of human beings. Such a thing was at that stage new and therefore unimaginable, and because unimaginable, unknowable. It's like that line of Beckett's too much it was too much like staring at the sun. It was, it was just impossible to apprehend as an idea, I suppose. Yeah, and, and this and this people. yes, and a lot of people, and there is a scene in the book which I I, I, I you know cherish because I think it goes to this, where a different whistleblower, actually, a member of the Polish resistance, not Jewish, he had no this man Jan Karski had no idea about Auschwitz. But he went to see Felix Frankfurter, the Jewish member of the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court in Washington, and told him what was happening. And Frankfurter said, I'm afraid I don't believe it. And um, the man who brought Karski said, but this man has impeccable credentials. You must believe. And he said, I did not say, listen to me closely. He said, I did not say he was lying. I said, I do not believe it. They're different things. And that is the problem that Rudolf Verber ran into, which was that People could not believe what they were being told. And I think there's some warnings there for our own time where we are warned often of looming catastrophe and we can know all the facts and all the science, but somehow that is not always enough. Human beings build up huge barriers to accepting the most terrible news. And Rudolf Erber, and after his heroic escape, was bringing out the most terrible news. Absolutely. Gosh, there's so many things to talk about. We're slightly running out of time. The um, It's fair to say, I think you say use these words yourself, he wasn't a terribly easy man to like. So the idea that incredibly important witnesses and uh, people who perform great services to humanity should be themselves saintly is rather undermined by Verba's own life a bit, isn't it? It is, and I'm very against that idea. This Writing this book has really made me feel uh, alert to that danger that we ex we demand from people who suffered great trauma, that not only that they've survived the great trauma, but they must be saintly, healing, uplifting figures who are there to dispense a kind of console, consoling wisdom to us. And and I really res resist that now because that was very much the, re re the demand that was placed on Rudolf Verber and a demand he refused to comply with. I mean, he was, be he was an angry Holocaust survivor. He was not a gentle, soothing Holocaust survivor, as I think we now expect the very elderly and dwindling group of remaining Holocaust survivors to be. Instead, said somebody, a colleague of his who I spoke to for the book, you know, you could not be sure if you invited Rudolf Erber to speak at a Holocaust memorial event, for example, you could not be sure that he would not descend into, quote, accusations and rage, unquote, that he would be this, uh, you know, spiky, prickly, prickly, 
angry figure when he was asked about this subject. Also, you know, a loving, devoted second husband, not so good as a first husband, but he, you know, was a he's um, he was a he could be a very playful man, uh, tremendously, you know, he could be warm. He loved a practical joke. He was this man of of many many parts, and a lot of people would talk about his extraordinary charisma um, and great presence. But partly why, until this book, perhaps a lot of people were not familiar with him, was because he was not, you know, a media friendly survivor who made himself famous, and that's a big part of why his name was lost. Is he wouldn't play the game. He was not somebody you would book on a chat show who could talk for six, seven minutes and leave everyone feeling happy. He was angry, and he was. Uh, angry in directions that people were not ready to hear. So he wouldn't just be dishing it out to the Nazis, which we're happy to hear that. But he would point the finger at lots of others and say, you think you were on the side of good in this story. It's not as simple as that. You know, you were warned. You didn't act on the warnings. You didn't do enough. The West didn't do enough. People, you, the Jewish community in Hungary in 1944, did not pass on my warnings, etc. He was a guy who, you know, pointed the finger an accusing finger. And that's not what people wanted to hear. And slowly and steadily, I think he was written out of the story in which he was actually and had played a towering role. He is a towering figure in the Holocaust. Last thing to say on it, it is through the Verbovetsa report that I, and I sketch out how through a series of diplomatic moves, 200,000 Hungarian Jewish lives were saved. The Jewish surviving Jews of Budapest I believe, were saved by the report that Rudolf Verber and Fred Wetzler wrote. It means he's a giant of this period, a towering figure who should stand alongside Anne Frank, Primo Levi, Oscar Schindler, you name them, as one of the defining figures of the period. Uh, he hasn't been until now. I'm hoping in some way that perhaps this book allows him to, you know, I write somewhere that put, to allows him to perform one last act of escape and to escape uh, forgetfulness, our forgetfulness, and be remembered. Yeah, <laughs> that's a wonderful answer, Jonathan. Thank you so much for joining us it, uh, and for speaking about this 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 extraordinary book. Join us next time for another conversation with an author shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize 2022. Our thanks again, as always, to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for their generous support of this podcast. Bye bye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.